again in the VLT. And now, as you see in x-rays, where supernova 1979 is actually seen, he was observing it um, just because this is what he liked to do. And at the time, his was only the third discovery by direct detection of a supernova. So in x-rays, it's been observed with several observatories. First with Einstein X-ray Telescope in 1980, which actually didn't detect it, and then later on in 1995 with the ROSAT X-ray Telescope. Now, between observations with ROSAT and now, there have been several observations done with Chandra, XMM, and, and also SWIFT. And while it isn't unusual to observe X-rays coming from a young, evolving supernova, what is interesting is that the X-ray emission from this particular object has remained remarkably steady. In addition, while it's also been steady, it's also been extremely bright. And we interpret this high luminosity or high brightness as evidence for accretion of supernova material back onto the black hole. Now, when we speak of accretion, what we're talking about is material that's being fed back onto something. And in the case here, as it's accreted onto the black hole, it heats up to very high temperatures and becomes very bright in x-rays. In the case here, we can use the brightness um, of the accretion onto the black hole to find out that this uh, black hole probably has a mass of around five times the mass of our sun. So the question becomes, why is it that we think that some of the X-ray emission that we're observing, or most of the X-ray emission that we're observing, is coming from accretion onto a black hole and not by other some physical mechanism? Well, as it turns out, there are actually several mechanisms for uh, X-ray emission from a supernova. One is that you have the blast wave that's expanding out into the progenitor's wind. And in this case, the blast wave will heat the surrounding material to high temperatures. The problem with our, that interpretation that we found in this case is that as the blast wave expands, the X-ray emission should actually decrease with time because it's expanding, the blast wave is expanding into less and less material. If we observed that the X-ray emission was fading, we might actually be comfortable with that interpretation, but as it is, we weren't. So another possibility is that when the star exploded, it formed what's called a magnetar. Now, a magnetar is a type of neutron star with an extremely high magnetic field. And the idea is that as this magnetar is formed, it loses some of its rotational power to the, uh, it loses some of its rotational energy and powers the light curve in x-rays. The problem here is that, once again, you know, the x-ray emission is actually going to be assumed to decrease with time. And we developed a model for what the magnetar emission should look like over time, and we found that we're about a factor of 10 times brighter than what the model predicts. So, excuse me. Now, while our observations are consistent with that of an accreting black hole, there's actually another intriguing possibility. And that is that we're looking at something called a pulsar wind nebula, such as the Crab Nebula in our own galaxy. In this case, instead of looking at something that's actually accreting material, we have a rapidly spinning neutron star that's sending out very high energy electrons and other particles out into the surrounding material. And in that case, we're actually looking at the emission from that star rather, we're actually looking from the wind rather than from the accretion. In any case, whether it's a pulsar wind nebula or a black hole, we're looking at one of these objects in its infancy and that in and of itself is exciting. So we have ideas as to how we can actually test these various theories. And we have observations which are coming up in the near future. And if we find that this particular object is still as bright as it's been for the last uh, almost 20 years at this point in x-rays, um, when you account for the fact that it was only redetected in 1995, we plan on maybe getting a longer observation where we can actually look at a detailed spectrum of this object and test whether the x-ray emission is coming from some sort of central contact object or the blast wave or possibly um, or likely a uh, combination of both. So with that, I'd like to turn over um, the speaker to Avi. Thank you. We are here to discuss a question that is often uh, asked in Hollywood. How do stars end their life? Except we're dealing with real stars. And when a star is uh, 10 times more massive than the sun, or even more than that, uh, the, star, the core of the star may collapse at the end of its life. Uh, once the nuclear fuel is consumed in, near the center of the star, um, the core collapses, loses pressure support, and collapses upon itself due to its own gravity. And it can end up in one of two ways. Either it makes a neutron star, which is the densest form of matter uh, that we know about. It has a density similar to that of an atomic nucleus. 
an SI comparable to that of a big city, or it ends up in a black hole, which is uh, an object to which you can get in, but can never get out of, uh, sort of the ultimate prison. And theorists, theoretical astrophysicists, were debating for many years about the uh, boundary between a star that can make a black hole and a star that can end up as a neutron star. And the fate of the star depends on many factors. Most importantly, the mass of the stars. Um, it can also depend on whether the star has a companion, whether it rotates, and so forth. The progenitor of supernova 1979c uh, is estimated uh, to have been a star with 20 solar masses on the boundary uh, that theorists postulated for the transition between a neutron star and a black hole. And so it could very well have been the progenitor appropriate for making a black hole. Uh, this particular supernova belongs to a rare type of um, these explosive events uh, that includes about 6% of all core collapse uh, supernovae. These are called type 2 linear uh, supernova in which the uh, light curve peaks and then declines steadily by many orders of magnitude. In difference for the more typical uh, types of supernovae, that reach a peak, decline a little bit, and then remain steady for a long while. These are called type two plateau. Now, about 20% of all core collapse supernova are believed to end up as black holes. And it is believed that stars more massive than about 20 or 25 solar masses end their life that way. If our interpretation is correct, and indeed, supernova 1979C ended up as a black hole. Then, of course, it's the first time that we're seeing um, a black hole being born in a normal supernova. It has been conjectured for a while that black holes do form in explosive events that take place across the universe. These are called gamma ray bursts. In these events, uh, the core of the star may collapse to make a black hole, and the black hole produces jets of matter moving at speed at a speed close to the speed of light. And those jets penetrate through the envelope of the star and eventually get out so that if an observer is lined up with the jet, it would see uh, a gamma ray flash. And we call these gamma ray bursts. We see such flashes roughly once a day coming uh, from uh, the edge of the universe. However, in this particular event, there is no evidence for a gamma ray burst. So it's the first time we see a black hole being born in a normal supernova. Now, um, the luminosity that we observe in X-ray is close to the limiting luminosity that a black hole can have. So if you feed a black hole uh, with a lot of masses, in this case, uh, the black hole may be fed uh, by a disk of material surrounding it, um, either uh, as a result of material that was left behind from the supernova explosion or as a result of a binary star companion that donates mass uh, to this black hole. Uh, in that case, uh, if the luminosity coming from the vicinity of the black hole exceeds a certain limit, the uh, force acting on the material outward would push the material and not allow it to accrete onto the black hole. And so there is this very natural characteristic luminosity that you would expect from a black hole that is fed well. And this is roughly the luminosity that we see for the typical black hole masses of five to 10 solar masses that one expects uh, from such events. Now, uh, it will take the black hole about 40 million years to double its mass. And so we cannot really trace uh, a change in the mass of the black hole during the course of the observation, the 31 years that we have observed this source. But the fact that the luminosity is steady is a clear indication uh, that we might be uh, seeing a black hole accreting at its limiting uh, accretion rate. And um, in particular, um, what we have are photos of this, uh, this source uh, during the first 30 years, during its infancy, uh, these photos are labeled by the age of the source, even though it took them a long time to reach us, uh, as we observe them today. 
If this is indeed a black hole, then there are uh, several important implications. Uh, first, uh, to the basic question of how uh, supernovae explode. Uh, there are two possible energy sources for uh, an explosion. It could either be a central engine, uh, just like the black hole that somehow releases uh, energy into its vicinity and powers it. That's how a gamma ray burst uh, takes place. Or it could be a radioactive material that is produced in the supernova that is powering uh, the light curve of the supernova. And so understanding the, um, the way that supernovae explode and, and which fraction of them end up as black holes and which fraction end up as neutron stars is very important for our theoretical understanding of these uh, important events. Uh, theories for many years had a difficult time exploding uh, massive stars on the computer. And it's quite possible that uh, they were right, that in fact uh, a, a fraction of those explosive events end up eventually imploding and making black hole. We don't know the relative uh, statistics of black holes and neutron stars to a very good uh, precision at the moment. And so observing events like that are very important in terms of calibrating uh, the statistics. Uh, in addition, um, black hole and neutron star binaries are important sources of gravitational waves. And there are observatories being constructed to detect these waves. And so we would like, of course, to know the abundance of black holes and neutron stars. And overall, uh, we're dealing with the properties of matter at extreme conditions, at very high densities, close to that of an atomic nucleus. Uh, and we cannot really reproduce these conditions in the laboratory. And so by observing the sky, we're able to learn about environments that cannot be reproduced in the lab and that can only be observed out there in the universe. Uh, of course, uh, if we go back in time to the very first stars, for example, the conditions there were different. It's quite possible, as some theorists uh, argue, that massive stars were much more uh, abundant at early times. And so the formation of black holes may have been uh, much more frequent at early cosmic times. And I will turn the, the stage to Kim. Thank you, Stan, for explaining this exciting result. Um, what is it that really matters in terms of this result? It's not just that possibly we have found the youngest nearby black hole. It is a young black hole, but what's really exciting about it is that we know the exact birth date of the black hole. We have found for the first time possibly the true birth date of a black hole. And you may ask, well, aren't black holes in the early universe younger, perhaps, than this one? Certainly, there are black holes that are forming um, all the time. And in the early universe, there might be very young black holes. But do we know their exact age? Do we know exactly how old they are? No, it's very difficult to do that. Um, when light has traveled billions and billions of years to reach us, it's hard to say exactly when a black hole that we're looking at was born. So this is a very important result to be able to pinpoint the birth date of a black hole for the first time. And for me, in terms of studying black holes, what's exciting about it is that we know it's very young. It is in its infancy if it is a black hole. And we want to watch how this system evolves and changes in its youthful stages from when it's first born to when it grows into a child and a teenager and gets older and accretes more material because that's how we understand the physics of black hole systems. Um, so that's very important. The other thing that's kind of neat about this story is it is a story. It's a story of science in action. And um, you, you know you've heard a little bit about the, the description of the observations, when it was observed. It was observed many times since with uh, NASA satellites and other uh, ob ob observatories. And so astronomers around the globe have taken images and, and data from this object and over time have put together this story, which is sort of like a detective story taking pieces of the puzzle and putting them together, and finally determining that, yes, indeed, we've almost solved the puzzle now. We just need a few more pieces, so we're very close to understanding the true uh, source, the, the genesis of this, this compact object in the center of this supernova explosion.